inform us of his truth. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 6. This is when the woman, speaking of Eve, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? I want to take my title, my thought from the latter part, from verse number 11. God asks Adam, he says, who told you that you were naked? I want to preach to us with the help of the Lord and your help, at least for the next few moments on this thought. Who told you that? Who told you that? Amen. Let's put our Bibles down. I, let's pray. Amen. Let us lift up our voice to the Lord. I need his help. We need the help of the Lord here today. I can't do this without him. He is divine, and I am the branches. Without him, I can do nothing. And God, I come to you right now, God, humbly. God, I come before you, God, knowing your word is anointed, God, knowing, God, that no life is here by coincidence, Lord. But you have set before us a beautiful and a powerful open door. God, I believe here today, God, that there will be trajectories of eternity that will be changed, that minds will be challenged and hearts will be brought to your gospel and to your truth. I pray, God, here today, I rebuke the devourer of the enemy, God, upon every mind, God, upon every heart. I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that this altar would be fruitful, God, that we would respond to the word that is being spoken into our lives here today, God. I pray right now, God, that your will would be done. God, touch my feeble lips of clay. God, help me get out of the way, Lord, and let your word speak to the heart of your people today. Lord Jesus, I thank you and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Can we just worship the Lord just for a moment before we're seated? Can we just lift up our hands all across this place and just begin to thank Jesus right now? Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I worship you today, God. I lift you up in this house. God, there is nobody worthy to be praised like you are, God. And I give you all the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated in God's house. Amen. There is a most interesting interaction between, in Genesis chapter number 3, between Adam and God after the fall. When Adam and Eve had sinned, rebelling against God, God's command to them was to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God calls to Adam, who was hiding among God, amongst God's creation, the trees in the Garden of Eden. God calls to Adam, and he asks him, where are you? Adam was really quick to explain when he finally approaches God, and he says, I was afraid because I was naked, and because of my fear, my nakedness, I hid. Something interesting happens here uh, in Genesis 3 and 11, where God asks him, who told you that you were naked? What an interesting question here today, and Adam doesn't, even though it's a really interesting question to say the least, Adam doesn't even have a chance to answer the final question. This first, uh, the first thing this newly fallen man tells his creator is that he was naked and he was afraid. Up to this point, the Bible tells us that they were living in a literally perfect world. There was no fear. and There were no clothes. So how did he identify this new feeling of fear? To take that logic further, how did Adam uh, continue to go on and say, I was naked? And, and what is nakedness? It's the, op it's the, po the opposite of that is clothes. But you've got to understand, Adam was not clothed with any clothes up until that point. And so to say naked 
really has no meaning in the context of Adam's experience. But nonetheless, he feared God, and he feared, and he was shameful of his nakedness. In fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25, the Bible says that man and wife were both naked in the garden, but it qualifies, it says, yes, they were naked, but they were unashamed. It becomes clear that there was not a state, and then it's rather in their state of nakedness, it was, that was not the change, but rather it was their perception and the conclusion about their state of nakedness that had changed after they ate of the fruit. There's a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Rashi, who's a commentator on, to, on the Torah and the Old Testament. He points out that now, uh, it is now associated with more, there, there's a lot more than meets the eye in this question that God asks Adam. And Rabbi uh, Rashi says that it's even a blind person knows now that they are naked, even though they never see themselves naked. What's happening here in this exchange between Adam and God? What, what is realized here? What, what is coming to fruition before our very eyes in this text here today? I want us to think about it this way just for a moment. All of us that have had children, amen, in our life, it, kids are notorious for running around trying to shed their clothes, running around naked. This is done in total innocence. A two-year-old doesn't see a difference between his face and his knees or any other part of his body. Us adults, we come and we insist, right, that they should be covered. Why? It's because we connect it to other information, additional knowledge that we know, and we realize that there's just some things that shouldn't be exposed. You've got to understand, prior to the sin of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve had indeed knowledge. They knew good from bad. They, they knew right from wrong, but they had not internalized the evil Man, that was in the world outside of the garden. They, they could choose to do right and wrong, but they were held responsible indeed for those things. But the urge to do evil was not within them. That urge was presented or represented in the thing of the serpent. It was that external tempter that, that, that tempted, amen, them to question, amen, and disobey God. And, and since evil did not reside in them, they were naturally good as God made them. It was because of this, their nakedness was innocent and in no way sinful. They saw no difference between the hands whose purpose was to cultivate life and to continue God's ordering process, or or the mouth which was one to praise God and say kind words to another, and even the parts of their body that were to be used to be fruitful and multiply. Every organ and everything that God had given them was to be used to fulfill the purposes of God, and there was nothing wrong in how God made them. There was nothing shameful about how God made them. Nothing needed to be covered and nothing needed to be hid. However, we see it very clearly. It seems like in a moment when they ate of the tree, that that evil inclination now was no longer an external factor, but now it was internalized on the mark of humanity. We see they no longer had an external tempter but not to incite them to sin, but now that temptation now resided in the heart of humanity. And now the imagination of evil was now internalized in mankind. And now because of this other information of evil that was present in the life of mankind, now they once seen the thing that was once beautiful, the one thing that was once holy, the thing that was once used to bring life and order. Now they perceive that thing not as once it was when they were in the will of God. Now they perceive it as something that was that was evil, that something that had a capacity for evil. And with that new revelation, that new understanding, it begins to change the course of humanity. That humanity now no longer sees just the goodness of God, but now we hear and see another voice. Adam says he was afraid and he was naked. This was, uh, this was his way of describing a new and welcome feeling of something that we would call internalized shame. This horrible awareness of being not okay, being vulnerable, being embarrassed, and even being exposed. I mean, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, it's been a few months now that I've been thinking about this very question, who told you that you were naked? Apparently we see here, that there was an immediate and awful awareness of change that happened in the garden. That there was something very wrong that gripped the heart of Adam and God's creation. It was somehow because of this new voice and this new word and this new revelation that they now have a very different view of themselves and even one another. From one moment to the next, we see this change. 
Something that was once holy and it was pure is now shameful and seemingly impure. I want us to take notice here really quickly of what God did not ask Adam. God did not ask him, how did you know that you were naked? God did not ask him, how did you come to the conclusion of how you were naked? What God asked him was, who told you that you were naked? I want us to consider this for a moment, that, 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 that within that garden, there are just four characters that are at play at this point. It was God, it was Adam, it was Eve, and it was the serpent. And on that road to that internalized shame, into that road, uh, amen, where evil now was no longer on the outside of man, but now it was in the heart of humanity. It had to be one or all of those, th- those, those three characters outside of God uh, that led Adam to the conclusion uh, of his shame, of his nakedness. Uh, amen. I want to preach to us here today. I want to thank God for the clarifying question that God asked Adam in that moment that is a still a salient, uh, amen, and, and still is a relevant question for us here today, is who told you? were fill in the blank. Can I preach to somebody here today? There are some things and some people, amen, that the voices that we are listening to in this day and age that are telling you things that you are not, and we are accepting them as they are true. Uh, amen, there is other information and there is other voices, uh, amen, that have informed areas of our life that God, uh, amen, has exclusively designed us uh, that he would be the one that would inform us of what that is. Uh, it would be God alone that would tell us who we are. Uh, amen, but my prayer here today uh, is that we would pull back the curtain on some of the sources of the voices, uh, amen, that have been telling us lies that have taken root uh, in our soul, uh, amen, that have got us to a place where we have agreed and we've taken some things as our identity and we believe that it is true, uh, even though the word of God says it is not true, uh, amen, I want to preach to somebody here today, uh, amen, who we listen to, uh, amen, impacts how we see our God and how we see one another and how we see ourselves. Questions in our reading today in our text that they directly speak to our lives here today that we have to pay attention to the voices that we listen to in our lives. I think about this and I see the brokenness of humanity in the world that we are living in. Sometimes I look at this world and I look at people. Amen. Not, 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 not looking down my nose, amen, not in any of those things, amen, not in self-righteousness, thinking that I'm better than anybody, but I see some things sometimes, and I'm wondering, who told you life had to be that way, who told you that you were not going to amount to anything, who told you, amen, that you weren't able to break the cycle of addiction or dysfunction, who told you that your marriage would always be like that, who told you that your kids wouldn't live for God, who told you, amen, amen, that your kids wouldn't make it out and make it through, who told you, amen, that your best days are behind you? Who told you that you were too young? Who told you uh, you were too old? Uh, amen. Who told you that you were too far gone? Uh, amen. Who told you you made too many mistakes uh, to make it back to Jesus? Uh, amen. I've come here today to preach to somebody. Uh, amen. I've come today to pull back the curtain on the lies uh, in the voices that we accepted as true. Uh, amen. And let you know if God did not tell you. Uh, amen. I want you to question who told you here today. Uh, amen. Oh, come on somebody. Uh, amen. I believe we have some of our aims fixed. Uh, we think things way a certain way and we see the world a certain way uh, and that's all we see uh, amen instead of seeing the beauty we see the shadows uh, amen instead of see oh come on uh, instead of seeing the beauty in your marital relationship all you see is the problems uh, amen but this preacher's come here today to tell you it does not have to be that way uh, amen God has a different way uh, amen God could still redeem things uh, God could still work in things amen I've been surrounded by death for far too long this year amen but I refuse to only see death uh, amen I see life and I see hope, and I see the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. We are not like those without hope. Amen. But there is a hope. Amen. I refuse to accept. Amen. Some things the way that they are. Amen. Because I believe. Amen. If God did not say it, I got a question. Who said it? Oh, come on. Amen. Amen. We got to be careful. We got to be careful. Amen. Of who we allow and what we allow to speak into our lives. I mean, it's, if we are not careful, those things will inform how we think, how we see, and how we live. Amen. God sent this preacher here today to preach to somebody, to talk to you, to reach to you here today. Amen. Just like God did to Adam in the garden. Who told you that? Amen. Who told you it would always be this way? Ourselves. Ourselves. The 
the first voice Adam had to contend with in the garden, the first voice humanity had to deal with in the garden was the serpent. The voice of Satan, the accuser. I talked to us here today. This is why Peter admonished the church, and he says that we should be sober and we should be vigilant. He says, your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion who walketh about seeking who he may devour. That we should not be ignorant of the enemy's devices. Uh, amen. What is the Bible telling us? What is Peter telling us? Uh, is that we should not be ignorant of how the devil works. We should not be ignorant of the place that the devil holds in this world. Uh, amen. Can I tell you here today? We, in other words, we got to know how to contextualize the voice of the enemy in our life. Uh, amen. I want to help somebody here today. Uh, amen. We got to be watchful. We got to be vigilant. No question. Uh, but can I tell you? Amen. The Bible says something about the enemy and how he works. Uh, if the enemy is talking, he's lying. Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. I want to help somebody. John chapter number 8 and verse 44, he says, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Amen. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Can I help somebody here today? Amen. When you hear the voice of the enemy in your life that is telling you you will not be able to break free, amen, from where you are, can I preach to you and help you and tell you, amen, you got to shake yourself loose uh, and say, if you're speaking to me, devil, you're lying. Uh, amen. If you're saying this is just my lot in life and this is just the way it is uh, and I'm going to try to do better, but I'm going to always fall on my face uh, and go back to where I started uh, and continue the cycle uh, of dysfunction and brokenness. Uh, can I preach to somebody? Uh, amen. If the enemy is saying you cannot make your way out of that, he cannot tell you the truth. Uh, he is just a liar uh, and he's the father of lies. Uh, amen. If the enemy tells you you will never amount to anything beyond where you are. He is a liar and he is the father of lies. If the enemy tells you, amen, that the condemnation of God, that the condemnation of the enemy begins to speak into your ear, it says you will not make it to an altar of repentance, amen, and you, your, your sins will not be washed and God will not forgive you. That is the lie of the enemy. There is no truth in him. Amen, I want to help somebody here today. Amen, anytime the enemy's talking, he's lying. Amen, we got to shut up the voice of the enemy in our life and say, you know what, if you're speaking to me like that, uh, I got to let you know where you are. Uh, amen. You are a liar, and I got no room for your lies in my life. Amen. The Bible tells us in Revelation a little bit more about the role of the enemy, the role of Satan in our life. Revelation chapter number 12, it says that now the salvation and power of the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. Brothers have been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. You've got to understand that that word accuser is like the word we would use in like a court environment. Man, the enemy is like a prosecutor. And he is looking to lock you up. And he's looking to keep you locked up. He's looking to keep you locked up in your mentalities and ways of thinking and perceiving the world. The enemy wants to keep you in darkness. This is why the Bible describes, amen, that while we are in sin, we, we are in darkness. Amen. We cannot see the light. Amen. The enemy wants to keep you in that place. The enemy wants to always, you always do to see the negative and the destruction and the evil and the wickedness of this world while not seeing the glory and the grace and the help and the hope of God. The enemy wants to keep you in that way. But I want to help somebody here today. Just like in a courtroom, the accuser, all they can do is bring up the evidence. Amen. All they can do is make a case of how you'll never make it. But the accuser, the prosecutor, does not have the final say. It is the judge that has the final say. There is a limit to what the enemy can do. And this is why the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, it is God who lifts up a standard against it. It is God who says, uh-huh, I hear what you're saying but my grace is sufficient amen my it is my mercy that it justifies them it is my blood that washes them amen you can make the case all you want enemy that this is just the way it's always going to be but I see life and I see them as I've designed and I've made them to be amen I see their marriage I see their family I see their home amen it's not just a house but it's a home amen I see it as it really should be you can make your case amen but it is me that has the final say to be able to distinguish the voice. When you hear 
voices, thoughts, and ideas that are not of God. You guys would say, wait a minute. Who told me that it was always going to be this way? Who said that this was always going to be the way it is? Amen. God is trying to help somebody here today. Amen. Who told you that? How did you come to that conclusion? Satan, constantly accusing God's children. Why? It's because he's driven by the hatred of God and all things that God represents. One of the biggest ones is mercy and God's forgiveness toward humanity. As the accuser, Satan aims to undermine God's love and diminish his mercy by standing before humanity and only pointing to your flaws. Paul to the Roman church says this in Romans chapter number 8. He says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. I want to talk to somebody here today. I want to give you some hope. Uh, Amen. Thankfully, amen, he is the prosecutor, but God uh, is the final judge. Uh, He is the righteous judge. Uh, Amen. That we could come to him boldly uh, before that throne of grace. Uh, Amen. And he will pour out his love on us. Uh, He will pour out his forgiveness on us. Uh, Amen. When you fall, uh, amen, you could come back to him uh, and God will pick you back up. Uh, Amen. Can I talk to somebody here today? Uh, Amen. I'm, I'm coming up against that mentality. Amen. I only could live for God if I got my life right uh, and everything figured out. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. Uh, Amen. That's a lie of the enemy. Uh, Amen. You don't get good to get God. Uh, Amen. But you accept the goodness of God in your life and it begins to change some things in you. Uh, Amen. Can I preach to somebody? There's some people that are standing on the outskirts. uh, Amen. Of giving themselves wholly and completely to God because they're afraid uh, if they make mistakes uh, that the enemy's just going to see. See here. uh, Amen. This is how it's always been uh, and this is just the way it's going to be. Uh, But I've come here today to help somebody. Uh, This is not how the the way the word the Lord works. Uh, amen. But the Bible says, when I don't re- rejoice against me, not my enemy. Uh, when I fall, uh, I shall uh, arise. Uh, amen. We are going to fall. We are going to mis- have mistakes, uh, but we can fall at the mercy seat of God. Uh, amen. We could call out to Him, uh, and He is a righteous judge uh, that will forgive us and wash us. Amen. Can we just thank God for His mercy and His grace just for a moment? Another voice in the garden speaking things and saying things. The voice of Eve. The voice that can personify Eve in a certain way. It, one of the other voices that we have to deal with is the voice of Eve or the voice of others that speak things into our life. Can I caution us here today? We need to be careful who we let speak into and over our lives. Genesis 35, it was, it was Benjamin's, Jacob's last son of his, of his wife, Rachel, the younger of two sons. And it was Rachel who was having a difficult childbirth. And it was very minutes after she gave birth to her son, before he was named in her dying breath, she named him Benoni. As she was dying in childbirth, she named him. She, I, I know I have a name for him. And she said, Benoni, you know what Benoni means? It means son of my trouble. There, in Rachel's life, that the son of her trouble was given birth to in that moment. But can I tell you, it was Jacob who looked at his son and says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to let you name him based on your dysfunction. And based on the hurt and the pain that we are feeling right now, I am not going to set the trajectory of my kid's life uh, based on the the troubles that we are facing right now. And it was Jacob that stood up and said, no, uh, I'm going to name him Benjamin, the son uh, of my right hand. Uh, Amen. The son of my strength. Uh, Amen. What did Jacob do? Uh, He refused to see Jacob. uh, Amen. As the son of his trouble. Uh, Amen. Just because it cost his wife uh, and cost his family something. Uh, Amen. Jacob said, no, no, no. Uh, I'm not going to speak this over my baby. Uh, Amen. I'm going to say he is going to be something. Uh, God's going to do something with him. Uh, God is going to ch- oh, come on somebody. Amen. I refuse. Uh, amen. To let the lies of the enemy get into the dysfunction of my home uh, and speak lies over my kids. Uh, amen. I oh, come on. I know my kids may be acting a fool right now, uh, but I'm not going to say that this is the way it's always going to be. Uh, but God can still do something. Uh, God can still set their mind right. Uh, God can still touch their heart. Uh, God 
Come on. I'm not going to say they're a Benaniah. Amen. They're not the son of my trouble. Amen. But they're the son of my right hand. I talk to somebody here today, uh, amen, uh, amen, there's so many things that we allow people to inform things in our life, uh, they say, man, uh, look at this, the dysfunction of this situation, look at the brokenness of this, uh, amen, and we just accept it as it's true, uh, and we stop praying, uh, and we stop prevailing before God, uh, we stop going before God and saying, God, uh, I know this is the way it is, and I know this is the way people say it is, uh, but God, I know you are able uh, to do exceedingly, uh, abundantly, uh, above all I can ask or think, uh, God, I understand it is not good right now. Amen. But can I preach to somebody here today? The Bible says that God works all things together for the good of them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. Can I talk to you here right now? There may be a lot of people that will tell you things are not good right now. But can I also tell you, amen, if it is not good yet, God's not done with it yet. If it's not good yet, God is not done with it yet. Amen. Who told you, amen, that your babies are always going to to be that way? Who told you uh, that your marriage was always going, oh, come on, who told you you were always going to be sick in your body? Uh, who told you you were going to wake up with crippling depression? Uh, who told you, uh, oh, come on, uh, I'm speaking against the echoes, uh, amen, of some abusive parents uh, that told you you were never going to amount to nothing. Uh, amen, I'm preaching against the spirit right now uh, that wants to tell you, uh, amen, you're always going to be a liar, uh, that you're always going to be a cheater, uh, that you're always going to be angry. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, who told you? you that uh, because God is saying something different. Uh, he's saying you are the son of my right hand. Uh, I got a purpose uh, that is greater than what you see right now uh, and I reject uh, the lies of the enemy uh, and I reject the lies of your parents. Uh, I reject the lies of society. Uh, I reject... Oh, come on, somebody. I reject the lies, uh, amen, of your haters. Uh, amen. I believe God uh, is the one that says who you really are. Uh, can we clap our hands unto the Lord in this place? Amen. Who told you you weren't worth saving? Uh, who told you you have nothing to offer? Uh, who told you, who told you, who told you? I've come to pull back the curtain. And other voices that have been speaking into your life. Telling you this is just the way it's always going to be. <laughs> and it is so dangerous. Be seated. It is so dangerous to value the voice of others over the voice of God in your life. You know, there's some of us that have come back from some dysfunctional, even church dysfunctional things. We hear echoes, and I should probably cut this off online, but I don't know, whatever, you know. We hear echoes of some of that dysfunction coming back. Amen. But God is trying to pull some things out of us. He's trying to say, that's not how I work. Amen, but we're hearing the echoes of other people's voices that are speaking, uh, amen, and reverberating in our lives. It is dangerous, uh, amen, to allow the other people's voices uh, to ring louder in our lives than the voices of God. Uh, why? It's because people change. Uh, opinions change. Uh, favor comes and favor goes when it comes to people. Amen, society switches up all the time. Uh, one day it's acceptable to do this, and another day it's not acceptable to do this. And so if you are living your life based on what other people say about you, uh, amen, you, you will define your reality on others' opinion of you, amen, and your life will become unstable, amen. You will not see, you will not know how to negotiate the instability of this world because you're caught between two opinions. That's why the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We got to value the voice of God above any, above any other person's voice, amen. You got to value the voice of God in the word of God over what society tells you, amen, over what your haters say, amen, over what your dysfunctional parents and family told you, amen. You got to value the voice of God over it all. When we get it switched, when we get it twisted, what happens is, we only operate in confidence when the approval of others come and pat us on our head and say, life is good. And I, I've been around church long enough to see it. Amen. Of everyone, they, 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 they see their value in God's kingdom. They see their value based on how people are patting them on their head saying, you're doing a good job. The dysfunction comes, amen. 
And all of a sudden now you're not seeking to hear the voice of God. You're just waiting for the pastor to whack you upside the head and get your life straight. No, no, no. We got to hear uh, the, what God is saying to the church. God, God is always speaking. Uh, we just got to tune our ears uh, to hear the voice of God. Uh, amen. We got to wake up. Uh, amen. And say, God, uh, amen. I know things are changing around me. There are echoes uh, and things that are speaking into my life. But God, uh, I don't want to hear your voice. Uh, I don't want to hear the voices of others. Uh, I want to hear your voice. Uh, I want my identity to come from you. Uh, I want my value to come from you. Uh, I want my... <laughs> I want my purposes to come from you uh, and you alone. Think of all the cases, and man, there's there's a lot, man. I don't have time to get into it. I'm already almost done with this. One of the prolific cases in the Bible of this is it was left up to up to David's father, Jesse. David would David would have never been king. But you know the story of David. Samuel that shows up in obedience to God. He says, all right, come to your house because there's a king in this house. The Bible says that Jesse gathers all of his sons except for one, David. The Bible tells us why. The reason why is David was just kind of a young, ruddy, complected little character that don't look like nothing. Amen. And the Bible says that, that Jesse he brings up all of his choice sons, the big ones, the good-looking ones, the ones that look like kings. He says, how about me? Samuel says, no, 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 none of these yet. You have another. And this is what Samuel says. Jesse, he says, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, but he says, I have rejected him, for the Lord sees not as man sees, but man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. It was God that was speaking into the heart of Samuel, saying, no, no, no. Man, I know others may think that those look kingly, but there's one on the other side, uh, even on the back side of the mountain, uh, amen, that I have a plan and a purpose for. Uh, amen, I, I know if it was up to Jesse, uh, he would have probably picked one of his other sons. Uh, amen, but can I preach to somebody, help somebody here today? I don't care what anybody says about you. The only thing I care about is what God says about you. Uh, amen, the only thing I care about, uh, amen, is that we are obedient to what God says uh, about us. Man. Hardest voice that we all have to deal with. It's the voice of Adam. What is the voice of Adam? The voice of Adam is our voice. The hardest voice to conquer is our own. This is why 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war against to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but divine have divine, divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion ra- raised against the knowledge of God. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is what this is what the Apostle Paul was dealing with. There's another translation that says it this way, and I love it. It says, We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Uh, can I talk to you here today? Sometimes the hardest voice that we got to deal with uh, that tells us all kinds of lies uh, is our own opinions and our own logic and our own thinking. Uh, amen. I want to talk to somebody here today. Uh, amen. We are called uh, to take, this is why the Bible calls it lofty. Amen. What is lofty? It means wise or logical arguments. Uh, amen. The real reality is we reason our way out of all kinds of the miraculous in our walk with God. Uh, amen. God wants to do wonderful and beautiful things in our life, but we reason our way and say, ah, you know, I, I think God can do this, but God can't do that. Uh, amen. I think God uh, can help us this way, but I don't think God can help us that way. Uh, and all of a sudden, we reason our way out of the miraculous of God. But God is saying, no, 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 no. Uh, amen. If you, you, who told you? Uh, that's how I work. Uh, amen. I do profound things uh, with broken things. Uh, amen. I, I turn the mourning uh, of individuals uh, and, and I clothe them with joy. I do wonderful things uh, with broken things. Uh, amen. I do beautiful things with people that realize uh, that you're not going to logic your way to God. You're going to take our thoughts. You're going to take your thoughts. And you're going to say, God, I know I see it this way. But God, I lay it down. And I'm trusting that you have a different way or whatever way you want to do it. God, not my will, but thine be done. Taking your thoughts captive means simply 
gaining control of what you think about yourself and life. Surrender it to God's truth above all else. In other words, our opinions, our thoughts aren't God's thoughts. Amen. I credit this one to Pastor Prado. Amen. Said something profound that just that shook me recently. Because we got to stop worshiping our thoughts. Oftentimes, our greatest disappointments in God do not come from the fact that God failed us because God does not fail and God cannot lose. God cannot lie. But oftentimes, our frustration and our anger and our resentment comes uh, toward God is because we believe God was going to work how we thought he was going to work. What are we doing when we say that? We are elevating and we are worshiping our thoughts, thinking that they are greater than his thoughts. Can I tell you this week, amen, I'm just being real, real with you. As I possibly can be. There's a lot of times this week that I, 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 I cried bitter tears because I did not understand what God and how God was doing things. I do not understand some things. I don't understand. I mean, I, going back all the way a year ago for crying out loud, there were prayers and things that I prayed and I sought God and I prayed and I fasted and I asked God mercy and grace over situations and things did not work out the way I wanted them to. And I'll be honest with you, I got a little angry with God, but I finally came to the place where I said, God, I realize my thoughts uh, are not your thoughts uh, and I realize God uh, that I have to take my idea of what I want and what I desire uh, and I have to take that captive uh, amen I gotta lay it down at your feet uh, just like Jesus did in the garden uh, he said I would that this cup would pass from me that's my thought I don't want to endure this suffering uh, I don't want to endure this pain uh, I don't want to endure this loss uh, I don't want to do that uh, but not my will but thine be done uh, and can I preach to somebody here today, if it was not for Jesus, uh, amen, surrendering to human thoughts, uh, amen, to the plan of God, uh, amen, you and I would not have a hope uh, that we have, uh, amen, here today, we would not have the chance uh, that we have uh, to have the redemption power of God flowing in this house uh, if Jesus uh, did not take the human thoughts uh, and say, ah, not my will, but thine will be done. Oh, Jesus, help us. God will allow us to go through some things. Because there's just some things we've accepted as true that are lies. There are some things that we've just accepted because we've elevated our thoughts so high. And when God begins to challenge us, when the word of God begins to challenge us, we get angry and we get frustrated and we feel called out. Why? Not because God hates you. It's not God doesn't hate you. He loves you. This is what the Bible says, that he chastens uh, or he corrects those he loves. Why? It's because he loves you too much to leave you lying to yourself. Uh, he loves me too much uh, to leave me thinking that I got life in my hands and I got it all figured out. Uh, God loves me too much uh, to think that I got life figured all out. No, no, no. Uh, he says, I want to let you know, son, uh, amen, like life and death is in my hands. It's not in yours. Uh, but I got to teach you some things through this, uh, that your thoughts are not my thoughts. Uh, your ways are not my ways ways. Uh, just as high as the heavens are above the earth, uh, so are my thoughts uh, higher than your thoughts. Uh, amen. There's some victory uh, and there's some beautiful things when we get to the realization uh, that some things that we've accepted and we told ourselves are just not true. Yeah. The Bible says that they had not seen rain. They had not seen water like that. How in the world is Noah supposed to build some proverbial ship, some ark, for water and floods that he had never seen in his life. He could not logic his way to it. He had to obey his way to his salvation. He had to obey his way to the salvation of his family. What am I saying? Is that Noah could have said, God gave him very specific instructions. He said, this is what you got to do. You got to use pitch it within and pitch it without. Use this kind of wood and use this and do that. Amen. And Noah had to build, amen, a boat, an ark that he had no idea how it was going to withstand. Why? Is because there were going to be some storms in life that came in Noah's life. Amen. That he had to trust that God had the plan uh, and God had it orchestrated from the very beginning. Uh, he, there was a moment that Noah had to say, if Noah built it on his own, it would be his thought, the thought in the back of his mind saying, man, is this thing going to make it? Is it going to be able to keep up? Is my family going to be safe? this if he built it to his design, his specifications. 
He logicked his way to his relationship with God. Can I tell you, some of our faith, faith that's logicked our way to things with God. Can I preach to you? Get God out of that box. Get God out of that box and say, you know what, God? I can only go so far on my own understanding. There's some things that I have accepted and I've told myself that are not true. I believe them to be true. But God, if they are not true, God, try my heart. Try the reins of my heart. God, Lee, I don't want to, I don't want to be lost in a lie that I've lied to myself. God, I want your help. If you are real, if you are who you say you are, God, I want to obey your word. I want you to show me. I want you to teach me. Amen. I, 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 want, I want your will and your way to be done in my life. Leah, if you could come. We are ever going to deal with who told us we were no good. Who told us we were not good enough? Who told us that this is just the way it's always going to be? Who told you? Who told you? If we're going to deal with that, we've got to deal with the lies of the enemy over our life. We've got to deal with the, the echoes of other people's lies and opinions of us. Finally, we've got to deal with something far closer to ourselves. That's the things that we tell ourselves. Let's stand to our feet here today. There is a liberty. There is a freedom. There is a hope that comes from understanding that God's ways are not our ways. one of us, if we are, if we are lucky, I don't, maybe lucky is not the right word to use in the church context, if we are blessed, we will see 85 years old. Do you realize how small of a time that is in the span? Not even just human history, that human history, 85 years is a pretty short time. But in the scope of eternity, how small that really is. That's why our life in the Bible is described, our life is like a vapor. It's there one minute. We turn around and we look and it's gone. And I tell you, there is such a liberty and a hope, Elder Silva, that comes when we realize, God, I do not have all the answers. I thank God that God's thoughts are not my thoughts. Not, can, I, can we just be real again and raw in God's thoughts? Because I have some weird ways of thinking. I have some thoughts that I pray and I hope they're not true. There is such a freedom in my life when I realize, God, this is the way I think. But God, I realize that this is not right. There's some opinions I have of myself. And God, I would be mad if somebody talked to my wife about it that way, but I'm real quick to talk to myself about it. I, I'm real quick to tear myself down that way. I would not accept anybody to talk down to you the way sometimes I talk down to myself. In those moments that I say, God, I thank you that you don't think about me the way I think about myself. God, there's some things, God, that if I try to do it on my own, God, it is crushing and it is debilitating and it will destroy me. It will break my family up. It will break up my peace. But, God, I thank you that my thoughts are not your thoughts. I thank you, God, that my ways are not your ways, God. I thank you, God, that I have such limited wisdom and I have such limited understanding 
I have such a limited time on this earth to make an impact. I have such a limited time, God, to do what you've called me to do. And God, I'm thankful, God, that my ways are not your ways. And I thank you, God. And I trust those things into your hands that are outside of my control. And I want your thoughts to inform how I think. God, I want your ways to inform how I lead my family. God, I want your ways, amen, to inform how I love my wife. God, I want your ways, amen, to help inform how I see myself and how I see the world around me. Come on, there's some of us that have been struggling with bitterness and brokenness and anger because we see the world one way. But there is a God here today to tell you uh, and start asking you who told you this is the way it's always going to be. Uh, and I'm opening these altars right now for anybody, uh, amen, that has courage, uh, amen, to say, God, I realize, God, that not all my thoughts are the right way. Uh, and, God, I want your thoughts to become my thoughts. Uh, God, I'm tired of hearing the echoes of my dysfunction.